Well, good morning, good morning, good morning. It's good to see you guys this morning uh, here in Big Church. That's the official name here uh, at Cottage Hill. This is, this is what we call it. Um, so this is a little bit different for me. Normally, I'm used to downtown church, which is about so much so here. So I'm going to have to kind of change my periphery and start focusing more here and here and all the way around here. Uh, so bear with me. Um, I heard a story this week, and I figured what better time to share it than share it with my, with my friends here. A uh, couple had been married for about 10 years or so, and they went to marriage counseling. Um, probably should have gone before this, but this is the story that I was told. So about 10 years they've been married. They went to marriage counseling. The um, counselor sits down with them, and he says, could you kind of just give me a timeline of when the disagreements started? And she said, oh, I can tell you. They happened exactly when he wanted to be in my wedding pictures. If you would, go ahead and turn in your copy of God's Word to Revelation uh, chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 2 through 5 today. But a, a recent survey reports the number one question people ask marriage counselors is how, is there any way that we can love each other the way we used to? Why don't we love each other the way we used to? This series, Family Vacation, we're going to be examining God's, uh, God's plan for the family, making the most of that family dynamic. And fa every family's got a different dynamic, right? It's like, oh, well, this is how we do things, this is how we do things. But today, we're going to be talking about making memories. And, and, and really, how do we bring back the romance? How do we rekindle our first love? The Bible teaches very clearly that marriages never stand still. We're either growing closer together or we're drifting apart. So what do you say uh, when, you're, when your marriage goes flat? You know, it's, it's stable, but there's no sparkle. Uh, there's no pizzazz. There's no pop. Um, you do the same thing Jesus told the church at Ephesus. Does anybody remember the church at Ephesus when they lost their first love? They were a good church, doing all the things right, speaking God's word, sharing, obeying God, but yet Jesus said, I have one thing against you. You have lost your first love. Now, in reverence to God's word, would you mind standing with me as we read God's word? In Revelation chapter 2, verse 2, it says, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not. And somebody's faster than me. And found them false. I know you are enduring patiently, bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have these, this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Pay very close attention to verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. A couple of things in verse 5. You can be seated. A couple of things in verse 5 where, where it's talking about you have forsaken your first love. It says, remember. Now, I'm not going to tell you what to do in your copy of God's Word, but I'm, I'm one that likes to either highlight, circle, underline, put some type of emphasis on the Word so that I remember where it came from. Remember. Circle it. Underline it. Whatever you want to do. Remember the heights from which you have fallen. Then, then, then repent. That's the second thing we must do. Do the things we did at first. You're going to choose to turn this thing around. You're going to choose to act in a romantic way. You're going to choose to act loving whether you feel it, like it or not. And then that last phrase in that verse, do the works, do the things you did at first. And then repeat it. Do the works, do the things you did at first. And then do the works, do the things you did at first. 
You see, we can, we can get complacent when we stop doing the things we did when we first fell in love. Now, I'm going to give you a little precursor to the rest of the service. Three words that could sum up this whole thing. Now, that doesn't mean stop listening. You still got to pay attention. But three words. Feelings follow actions. Feelings follow actions. If you begin to act in a romantic way, you will feel romantic. But most couples don't get this. In fact, I hear, I hear all the time, um, Neil, I, I just don't feel the same way towards them that I used to. Or, Neil, uh, I don't feel towards him like I used to feel. Or I don't feel like the same person anymore. And they sort of, sort of wait around like there's this magical romantic bolt of lightning that's going to hit them from the heavens and it's going to, pow, you will feel again. No, it doesn't work like that. Because feelings follow actions. One of the deepest and most profound spiritual truths we can glean from God's word today is that feelings follow actions. Most people live their lives based on their feelings. They sort of go through the motion. Whichever way the wind blows, that's how I, however I feel, that's what I do. It's like this. I feel like I need to start exercising again, okay? So day one, I start exercising, all right? Maybe day two, still going at it. I mean, I'm really only committing maybe 30 minutes of my day to this whole exercising thing day three the only thing I'm feeling on day three is sore am I right and then and then all of a sudden I'm not working out if I don't feel like it feelings we got to start doing it before we can start feeling it if I if I another example I really, you know, 2021, 2020 was a tire fire, so 2021, I'm really going to get into God's Word. I'm going to read God's Word. Uh, it's going to be great. It's going to be fantastic. I've got a reading plan. It's all good. I really feel like I need to be doing this. And by the time February hits and I'm in Lamentations, I'm like, Pfft. I don't feel like that because I don't understand what there's even in there. I don't even, uh, numbers? Because, we, because our feelings, we're, we're trusting our feelings. because other things become important. I don't have enough time. Well, you had enough time to take a shower. You had enough time to brush your teeth, hopefully. You had enough time to eat breakfast. It's the most important meal of the day. But we don't have enough time to spend time in God's Word. Feelings follow actions. Maybe you're going to step out in faith and you're going to take, take the risk and tithe. Give 10% of what God's given you. You do it one Sunday, it feels great. It's like, man, this is awesome. Do it the next Sunday, rocking and rolling. Somewhere between second Sunday and third Sunday, the brakes go out. AC goes out in your house. Ooh. Probably can't give right this week. And then a new practice starts of the ones where you forget to do it. You don't feel like it. Whenever I feel like doing it, I do it. Whenever I don't feel like doing it, I don't do it. And then all of a sudden the don'ts outweigh the do's and you don't do it anymore. God says, let your actions dictate your feelings. Think about it. When I do these things and I don't feel like it and I develop these habits, all of a sudden I miss it because I've developed the habit of doing it. When you begin to act in loving ways, even if you don't feel like it, you start to start loving. Because if you're waiting around for that romantic feeling to come back, that loving feeling, Top Gun, anybody? You've lost. 
that love and it's in your head you're going to be thinking about it like this afternoon you're like I can't take my nap because I'm thinking about Top Gun anyway but when you learn to act romantic and in loving ways and do these things you did when you first fell in love you'll fall in love all over again because the feelings follow the action you're sensing a theme here so what's the first thing we got to do attention we have to give attention We're focusing in on the person we love. Look at what the Bible says about this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 2. Live together in love as though you had only one mind and one spirit between you. Look to each other's interests, not merely your own. The word look there, it involves attention. The very first sign you knew you were falling in love is when you notice somebody was paying attention to you and you were paying attention to them. Hello. We have to start paying attention again. Does anybody know how much attention you paid to your spouse when, when, when you got married? Let me show you. I'm, I'm going to give you an example, okay? This is how much, the things that, that Neil did when he was wooing Miss Allie. I had a Jeep when I was in college. First date. No top, no doors. First date, I'm taking her an hour down the road. Let me tell you how much attention I was paying. I literally walked to the passenger side of the car and opened the imaginary door. (laughs) Helped her get in and then closed the imaginary door. Safety, right? Safety first. Even helped her put on her seatbelt. We gave flowers. We gave gifts. We did all these things. We did things, guys. I'm going to be honest with you. I cannot stand to talk on the phone. And I would talk on the phone all kinds of time. Huh? I did all these things. You know why? Guys, it's like this. We operate in boxes, okay? We, we, We compartmentalize our lives, okay? And in in that box, that was the get a wife box, and I was going to do whatever I had to do to get a wife. And I put all, all kinds of resources and time and, and, and money into this get a wife box. Well, then I got a wife. Put it on the shelf. Then I started working on get a career box. Get a J-O-B. That's how we operate. Ladies, in case you didn't know, that's how we operate. Okay, this is free. Next thing, I'm going to tell you how women operate. They also have a box system. However, theirs is more of a, uh, I can operate with this box, and I got this box, I got this box, I got this box, I got this box, I got this box over here, and I got that box that's behind the other box. And I know what so-and-so was wearing in this box, and when she wore it, and what, where the sun was in the southern sky, and what time zone I was in. And by the way, when I was focusing on this box, you were talking about that one box you got to worry about. (laughs) Women can multitask, right? And they can keep score while they're doing it. (laughs) This is free and you're welcome. But they can process all those different things. So guys, see, here's the problem. We're sitting there dealing with the watching the TV box and our wives come and tell us things this is what it looks like they come and tell us things and they walk away and then they come back and say do you remember what I told you? Hmm? Uh, you were talking? uh now, this is not an opportunity for you to say, honey, I'm sorry, pastor said we could focus on the TV box. No, 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 no. This isn't that. What we have to do is realize that even though we've moved to career box and the providing for our family box, we still got to pay attention to the get a wife box. We cannot let that atrophy, we cannot let that dwindle. Do that this week and never underestimate the power of attention. But then there's affirmation. And 
if you want to rekindle your first love, you have to give affirmation. The most powerful way you can do that is through words of affirmation. Tell her how much she means. Wife, tell him how much she means, how much he means. We fall in love with the people that admire us. Admiration and appreciation are so important. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says this, give encouragement to each other and keep strengthening each other. That's not Neil, that's God's word. Everybody wants to be admired. Everybody wants to be encouraged. Romans 12.10 says, take delight in honoring each other. How do you honor? How do you affirm your mate? You say it out loud. Say it out loud. Neil, you say, I, I, I really don't feel, I, I feel more like I need to, um, how do I say this? Uh, positively encourage. You know what that means? Nag. I need to um, creatively build up, criticize. But again, that may be what you feel like doing, but what did we say about feelings a while ago? Feelings follow actions. When we start to encourage with our words, with our actions, the feelings follow. When we start to build up, the feelings follow. But if we start to nag, the feelings follow. When we start to tear down, the feelings follow. I'll tell you how to affirm your spouse. Real easy. I love you. You make me better. I'm a better me when I'm around you, and I'm not a better me when I'm not around you. You may think, well, Neil, this is a great message for those that are married today. I'm going to flip the script on you. Hey, God, I'm a better me when I spend time with you. And I'm not a better me when I don't. I'm an ugly me. I'm an unkind me. But I'm a better me when I'm around you. So we have to affirm, but we also have to have affection. Affection is key. It's vital in our marriage relationships. Colossians 3.19 says, husbands, be affectionate. When you see a couple walking hand to hand, I mean, hand in hand, hand to hand, they're definitely married, right? <laughs> hand in hand, married, dating. Nine times out of ten, they're dating. You see them sitting at dinner, and they're looking longingly into each other's eyes. They're dating. You know why? Because if they're married and they're sitting at dinner, you know what they're doing? Eating. <laughs> if you're in my house, drinking a Coke because the kids are at home, we're having a good time. But again, what are we doing to show affection? Holding hands, giving a hug, spending that intentional time with each other. The things we did when we were courting her, the things we must do now if we want to fall in love again. Well, Neil, I just don't feel like it. Do I need to repeat myself? Feelings follow actions. You're going to get it in a minute. And again, it's biblical. Ephesians 5, 28, a very beautiful verse, says this. In the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies, he who loves his wife loves himself. Well, Neil, I'm, I'm not naturally affectionate. Well, guess what? You can change. Hello. Did you know that babies can actually die from skin deprivation? 
No touch, not touching. They can, they can atrophy, they can, they can actually die from that. Touch and affection are very important. UCLA did a study not too long ago. I need you paying very close attention to this. This, is, this has some, some uh, information here, men, women. UCLA study found that for wives that kiss and hug their husband every day before he goes off to his day, kiss and hug, you actually increase your husband's lifespan by almost three years. Now, hold on. You didn't hear me. You're sitting there going, okay, three years, three years, three years back. That's insurance policy. What does that look like? Um, how many motors on the boat are we going to have? Uh, 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 how big is the boat going to be from the policy when three years? You know. Not that. No. Three years you can add to your husband's life by a simple kiss, a simple hug. Those things, that affection, feelings, follow action. Genesis 26, 8 from the King James. Focus very uh, at the end there where it says Isaac was sporting with Rebekah, his wife. The Hebrew word there literally means to caress playfully. It's the first time sports were mentioned in the Bible, as you heard it here. God says, I'm not ashamed of this. Caress playfully. Now, men, this is, again, you can play this sport year-round. Indoors, outdoors. Just saying, that's free. You're welcome. Caress playfully. Fourth thing we must do is we need adventure, okay? Adventure. When you first started dating, you were adventurous. You were unpredictable. Most marriages are dull. Ecclesiastes 9.9 9 says, Enjoy life with your wife whom you love. Again, look at that word. Circle, underline, highlight, enjoy. 1 Timothy 6.17 says, God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Matthew 11.19 says, Jesus came enjoying Life. Are you sensing a theme here? Anybody? Jesus was not boring. He was not dull. He was not a kill. He came enjoying life. He came. He lived a great adventure. But most marriages don't reflect that. Here's a question: Are you fun to live with? Are you fun to be around? Are you just a bump on a log? When was the last time you did something? just for the fun of it. No reason, no purpose, no intentionality. It was just like, hey, this is something fun to do. We're going to do it. Let me explain something to you. Yesterday, out of the single most random, I get a text. I'm here tying up a few loose ends. I get a text from our oldest, Carly. She says, hey, what time are you, you going to be home? I don't know. It's Saturday. I'm sermon prepping. Well, we just need to know when you're going to be home. I was like, okay. Probably within the hour. Okay. Why? We're having, and just, so we're all on the same page here. My name is Neil White. I live at the White House. We had yesterday the White Family Olympics. And you may think, what is that? Because I was unaware. We had like eight different categories, and we were divided up into three teams, the six of us. Allie and I got to come strong in second. <laughs> Silver medalist. But we did all kinds of fun stuff, completely random. There was this whole score system and a whiteboard. I love a whiteboard. My family loves a whiteboard. It's... But we, wa- we, we played games in the pool yesterday. Because you know what? The family that prays together and plays together stays together. And it doesn't require all this planning. It doesn't require all that stuff. Sometimes it just requires, hey, I'm going to have fun. And we're going to have fun together. Because you know what? It's real easy to get real busy. And then by the time we get busy, we're busy being busy. 
we take the fun out of life. Dating your mate once a week, once a month, it's a spiritual thing. Because guys, let me explain something to you. Your sons are looking to you to lead. How you lead the family is how they're going to lead the family one day. Your daughters are looking to you because you are the model that they look for in a husband one day. And you're never past the point of return. You're never past the point of repenting, turning, and changing it up. Okay? So don't leave here all hangdog and thinking you can't do it because you can and don't give me this one I love you and if it changes I'll let you know that doesn't work doesn't work because our spouses need to hear this on a regular basis the fifth thing final thing accordance spiritual accord spiritual oneness that fifth ingredient, ingredient to bring the love back into your life is accordance. Look at 1 John 1, verse 7. It says this, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The key to fellowship with your mate, the key to joy with your mate, the key, key to bringing back the love for you to have is that spiritual oneness. When Allie and I are growing closer to the Lord, we're naturally growing closer to each other. It's a byproduct. If we're both living for the Lord, then it pulls us together, it draws us close in a bond that nothing else can take the place of. Spiritual harmony, spiritual oneness leads to emotional oneness, which leads to physical oneness. The deepest part of oneness and a lot of people leave out the spiritual oneness God wants our marriages to be clicking on the same all on all cylinders well Neil before we go could you please tell us how to have spiritual oneness I don't mind if I do the first thing you must do is commit your life to Christ both of you Remember, critical, nagging, doesn't work. How do we point our spouses to the Lord? We have to both commit our lives to Him. How can you love your mate the way they need to be loved without Christ loving through you? If she's walking with Jesus and I'm walking with Jesus, guess what? It's very difficult to fight. Do you know why? Because Jesus doesn't fight with Jesus. There you go. There's math for today. <laughs> Second thing, write it down. Pray together. Well, Neil, I'm not real comfortable praying. Could you show me how to do it? Yes. Hey, honey, what can I pray for you today? Well, I've got these meetings, and I'm a little bit nervous. I'm, not, I'm, I'm concerned about how these meetings are going to go. Could you pray for me? Yes. Dear Lord, I need you to pray for, fill in the blank. She's got meetings today. It's going to be difficult. Be with her. Give her peace. Amen. Say the same thing back to him. Hello. If you're a halfway decent listener, you can repeat exactly what she tells you. That's easy. You're welcome. Spiritual oneness is the key to emotional oneness, which is the key to physical oneness. God wants you to have all three. But here again, we must share our spiritual lives together. How do we share our spiritual lives together? Today, when you leave big church, hey, honey, what did you learn at church today? She'll just tell you. Hey, kids, what did you learn at church today? And be careful, you may learn something again that you didn't learn the first time. And then, be ready, because they're probably going to ask you, hey, Dad, what did you learn at church today? At least have one thing, okay? Feelings follow actions. There you go, it's free. We've got to model it. As we share our spiritual life together, 
in those ways, we grow closer to each other. We do these things. Attention, affirmation, affection, adventure, accordance. Because we have to know, hopefully you know, let me be clear, God loves us more than we could ever love ourselves. And if we've truly given our lives to him, totally and completely, the natural byproduct of that is we love our spouses. We love the world around us. We point people to Jesus. You know why? Because we spent time with him. We have a relationship. We know Jesus and he knows us. What I'm talking about here, we're not splitting atoms. This isn't rocket science. It's real easy. If I call myself a Christian, say that I love Jesus, the love of Jesus should flow out of me in everything I say and everything I do. My actions. And those feelings follow. Would you bow your heads with me? Today, there may be a, a, a point in your life where you, you, you cannot find a point in your life where you've asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life. You don't know. I literally had a conversation this week of somebody that said, hey, I don't know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And we got it nailed down. We don't come together just for just the sake of hanging out. We come together to worship the Lord that loves us so much he sent his son to die a gruesome death on a cross for each and every one of us in this room. The least we can do is love. So if there's never been a point in your life where you've asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, We're going to have some pastors up front. The altar's open. Find somebody. Grab me. And get it right. Don't leave here today without knowing. But as we leave here today, let's leave here in love. God, today, Lord, our prayer is that you would use us Use us, God. Use us to show the world around us what true love really is. Let us model it in our marriages. Let us model it in our relationships. Let us model it in our lives. Lord, we love you and we praise you and we thank you. In your son's name. Amen.